Good morning, everyone. How are you? You wouldn't tell me the truth even if I <laughs> tried to pry it out of you. <laughs> but we're here this morning, amen? That's all that matters. We're in the right place. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless this message this morning. Thank you for our, our earlier service and the words that we heard there with uh, Pastor David the Flame, Pastor Barry Quirk. Thank you for their faith, their life, and the ministry that they have to the body of Christ. We pray that you would bless this message. Bless, uh, well, Lord, may the, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead May it quicken my mortal body here this morning, which has not been in very good shape the last couple of days. So I ask you to do that and bless your people. Minister to us through your spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you uh, turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Galatians, the third chapter. I'll tell you a funny story. Um, a woman had two sons, and they were very unruly young boys. And she didn't know what to do. She was at a loss as to, you know, how to discipline them, how to get them to behave themselves, because apparently they were really out of control. But she heard that there was this, uh, this new pastor in town, and he was, you know, he worked a lot with young people. Somebody suggested and said, you know, you ought to bring those boys to see him because he will, he will really straighten them out. So she did, and uh, she went with her boys, and first she got to the office, and, and the secretary said, well, send the first young boy. He was a little bit younger. So he walks in, and the uh, pastor is sitting behind his desk. He's a big guy. He's very intimidating. And the young boy came in, sat in this big chair in front of the desk. And he didn't say a word at first. He just looked at him. And I think his goal, his objective, was to try to put the fear of God into this young man. So he just finally, after moments of silence, he looked at him and he just said, Where is God? And the young boy just, just couldn't, I mean, he was in just shock, fear, couldn't move. And again, now this time he leans over, he said, Where is God? And after he said it the second time, the boy, he just ran out of the office, got right up, ran out the doors, and, you know, past mom, past his older brother, and just ran out, the, out of the building and ran to his home. Well, the older brother went in, and then mom grabbed him, and after they were finished, they came home, and they started to search for their younger brother, and they couldn't find him. They found him in a closet, sitting in the closet. The older brother opens the door. He says, what, what happened? We, we, you know, what in the world? He says, we are in big trouble this time. He says, why? He says, what are you talking about? He says, because God's lost and they think we stole him. <laughs> Where is God? <laughs> I don't know. What are you asking me for? Oh, Lord. In the book of Galatians, the theme of this great book that Paul wrote to the churches in the Galatian province, it really, it's the vindication of the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. And in this beautiful book, Paul calls it just that, the gospel of grace. And this morning, we should underscore that word by saying it's the gospel of pure grace. Don't try to mix or mingle it with anything else. If you do, you corrupt the gospel. And in Paul's day, there were many, so many. An interesting thought and idea, in fact, is that Paul would come in and he would preach in these local churches. He would uh, establish them, or so it would seem, in the grace of God. They would have an understanding of the finished work of Christ. They would clearly see that it's all of grace. And then, after some time, the legalizers... The Judaizers, those of what Paul said of the circumcision, would come in, and they would follow up in where Paul had preached this glorious gospel of grace, and they would begin and come in and just say, listen, what Paul said is accurate to a certain point. 
to a certain extent, what he said is accurate. But his message only goes so far. And we are here to give you the rest of the story. We're here to tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help us, Satan. I mean God. Because Paul, again, his whole theme, justification by grace. And vindicating, that's what he was doing, vindicating the gospel of grace from any admixture whatsoever of law conditions which qualify or try to destroy the character of pure, unadulterated grace. And he didn't, you know, he didn't mix any words when he went at them. I mean, he basically took a few moments at the beginning of this epistle, introduced himself, and then he went right to the heart of the matter in verse 6 of chapter 1. He says, I marvel, I'm in shock that you are so soon removed. And, and I like the way he said it, from him, because that's what happens when we start to move away. And by the way, what happened in the Galatian churches can happen to us, and it does happen to us potentially so often in our lives. We understand and remember that day when you cast yourself at the foot of the cross for salvation. I mean, you just said, I can't do anything to save myself. No doubt the gospel was explained to you in such a way that all you had to do was embrace it by faith. Maybe, like me, you even asked those of you, uh, those that were sharing the gospel with you, you asked them questions like, well, what do I have to do? Or, you know, where do I have to sign? And where do I have to become a member? And how faithful will I have to be? And how consistent? And what will I have to stop? And what will I have to start doing? And all of those questions. And to have those people who shared the gospel with me say to me, you don't have to do a thing, but trust everything that he did for you. And that alone saves you, seals you, sanctifies you, even glorifies you, and comes with the promise that you will be secure all the way to the finish line. I mean, I heard that. I, I, I said, that is amazing. But I'm not so sure I believed it. Because I thought certainly along the way there have to be some conditions. Certainly along the way there have to be some strings attached. And as Paul was Vindicating this gospel of pure grace, he, uh, pure grace, he got to the third chapter, and, and he starts and, and, and really kind of approaches it from another angle, and he calls them foolish Galatians. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you? In the first two chapters of this epistle, you know, he defends his apostolic authority, and he did it beautifully. And he did that against the efforts of the Judaizers to, they tried to discredit it. That's really what they were doing, saying, you know, Paul, you know, yes, he, he, you know, we're so thankful for his salvation, but he is not who he says he is. He is not an apostle. After all, you can ask any of the original apostles, was he there walking with Jesus as were the other 12? Was he there listening to all of his message, messages like they did? Did, they, you know, did he witness the miracles and see Christ? person? No. And so they, they tried to discredit him. But he revealed to them in the first two chapters that he was called and he was ordained and he was God's man to preach this gospel. And then he gets into the third and fourth chapters and then he turns, you know, very... Uh, like a systematic theologian, it turns very doctrinal. And now he defends the doctrine of justification by faith alone, without works, against that of the Judaizers, who taught that the works of, of the individual gave them acceptance with God. And I think it's easy for us in our lives on a daily basis to cross a line where even though we understand, we recognize, we quote we look at it, we contemplate it, we reflect upon it, we consider it often, it is finished, and yet we live our lives as if it were not. And we step into a performance-based relationship with Christ. And we step into a mindset where it almost seems like we are maintaining what we once realized we could never attain. In other words, salvation. Did we attain it? No. We did nothing but cast ourselves upon the work of the cross. And the hearing of faith is what saved us. Well, if we could do nothing to attain this great salvation, 
Is there something we could do to maintain it? The answer is no. And Paul put it this way. He says, you, you foolish Galatians. J.B. Phillips, in his translation, he says, Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. <laughs> and then he, he followed that up by saying, Surely you cannot be so idiotic. But we could answer that question and say, Yes, we can. Yes, we can be that idiotic. Yes, we can be that foolish. Foolish here, the word means non-thinking, non-reflecting Galatians. And I think that the reason why we have this passage on the wall of our church up here, right there at the cross, is because we want to keep reflecting upon that. We never want to stop reflecting on the finished work of Jesus Christ. We never want to stop considering this great work that he accomplished for us. Because it's as easy for us to be bewitched as it was for the believers in the Galatian provinces. He actually used this word. He said, not only who has bewitched you, but who has demonized you. That's a strong word, isn't it? He said to them, you've become dull. You've become stupid. That word stupid, it implies deadness and impotence of intellect. He says, you've stopped thinking. And... Wouldn't the devil love churches today to, and get them to stop thinking? I, I was speaking with a brother, a pastor of a church the other day, and he said he went to this big, big convention. And, and I said, how was it? He said, well, there was just a lot of this. I said, what does that mean? He says, well, there was just a lot of this, a lot of jumping up and down. He said, I never saw so many bodies moving so quickly in all my life. I said, well, was there anything else? He says, well, there wasn't a lot of doctrine. There wasn't a lot of teaching. And I'm certain that if the devil could accomplish that in our lives, he would love to do that. Sure, do this, but don't do any thinking. Jump up and down. Get excited in your emotions. Have good feelings. And, 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 and try to have the best life you can while you're here. But don't do any serious thinking with Christ in relationship to the cross. He wants to do that. Paul said, who cast a spell upon you? You see... Doctrinal error affects people that way. They may be converted and they may be even saved by grace, but then they fail to study and to be taught sound doctrine. And the next thing you know, you find yourself under a spell. You can find yourself bewitched. You can find yourself dull and stupid in relationship to the truth about what Christ has done. And Pastor Barry shared it earlier this morning. We, we sometimes forget it. I mean, it completely finds its way out of our minds and our souls and our thinking capacity where we were saved by grace and we're kept by grace and will be preserved and presented faultless and blameless to God's throne by grace. But we forget that. And subtly, we enter into some form of performance, some form of works program, some form of behavior that we feel is acceptable to God. And it even affects us to the point where we start believing that we are having good days and having bad days when every day, according to the Bible, is a grace day. Every day. Because we are living and we are counting on and we are, we are being preserved every moment by the grace of God. And, and we just need to constantly be reminded that it will never require any effort on our part except the hearing of faith. Which is what we're doing this morning. Imagine, you will never be more productive than you uh, ever will be in your life as you assume the position you're assuming this morning. What is that? Sitting down. You're sitting down because that's a reminder that that's where everything starts and that's the, 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 the finished point of everything in our lives. You're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul said to them, you, you, you're not able to reason these truths out. You're not able to even detect any longer what is true and what is false. And, and then he, and he, interesting, isn't it, that he, asked, he used that word, who? Who did this to you? Almost as if he's like trying to find the names or a group of individuals that he could, you know, bring these accusations against. He knew who the false teachers were. He knew about their activities. He knew about all of that. But he uses the singular pronoun. Why does he use the singular pronoun? Because behind their activity was the activity of one, the devil himself. That's why he uses that singular pronoun. That's why he didn't say, oh, I know the names of all those. It wasn't about them. 
He said there was something of force, uh, a dark force behind the Judaizers, and it was the devil himself, because you can be absolutely certain of it. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank. The one person who does not want your heart established in grace, the one person who does not want you to be strong in the grace of God in 2 Timothy 2.1, the one person who does not want you to continue in this message of grace is Satan himself. He'll do everything to stop it. He is a liar. Jesus himself said he's a liar and the father of lies in John 8, 44. And he said he's been blinding your eyes to the truth of Christ openly crucified. I like that because that just brings us back to the all-important place of our lives. The crucified Christ is the gospel of God. Whereby sin is uh, what? justified in the eyes of God. They're justified before God, and they've been justified by God, not because of any works of their own, but because of his atoning work on the cross. You see, it is so important for us when we preach this message that we are not, you know, we don't go out and proclaim the gospel and say, hey, the gospel is, is good advice to men. It's not. The gospel is the good news about Christ to men. That's the gospel but you, you talk to some people in our culture today, and you would assume that the gospel is really is teaching from the Bible of how to live a good life. Nonsense. Nonsense. The gospel of the grace of God teaches us that you cannot live a good life, that a good life is beyond the reach of every single one of us, that a good life is absolutely impossible, and righteousness is unattainable by any of us that have sinful natures. We need to be born again. We need the work of the Spirit. We need a gospel called grace. We need the Bible filled with promises. We need the Spirit's work, not ours. Thank God this morning that the gospel is not good advice to men, but the good news about Christ to men. Not an invitation for us to do anything, but a declaration of what God has done for us forever. That's the gospel message. Not a demand, not a demand, but an offer. Do you want it? Will you take it? It's a gift. And it's not like some Christmas gifts. You ever get a Christmas gift? Somebody surprises you with a Christmas gift? What's your first thought? Oh, I didn't get them anything. Right? Immediately, payback. I'm on their list. I owe. I saw it happen in my own family this year. During Christmas, somebody was overlooked. There was a gift that overlooked. You should have seen the look of fear on their face. They began to go to the car and scramble and look for extra gifts that were given to them so they could quickly re-gift them and say, here's your gift. Why? Payback. We owe glory to God this morning in the body of Christ. We owe him nothing. He paid it all. He paid it in full. We are free. The gospel is free, and it's, it's there for the taking. It's there for the taking. Christ crucified. To attempt to add works to the work of Christ is an offense unto him. It's an offense to the finished work. As we read in, in Galatians chapter 2, we back up a little bit to verse 21. Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came on the basis of the law, then Christ has died in vain. Could we attain unto a righteousness, the kind of righteousness that God requires, that God was looking for on the basis of law-keeping? Absolutely not. Then why do we sometimes invite good bookkeeping into our lives as a way of being made right with God? As I mentioned earlier, having those good days and those bad days. No such thing. You're either perfectly saved in Christ or you're perfectly lost in Adam. There's no middle ground. You don't have good days or bad days. You don't hope to be better. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You cannot improve upon that. You should just celebrate it and worship God because of what he's done on your behalf. The Galatians should know this. He said in verse 2, he writes to them, he says, This only what I learn of you. How did you receive the Spirit? By the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Amazing. Are you so foolish then, having begun in the Spirit, somehow now you are made mature or perfect or rendered acceptable in the sight of God on the basis of the flesh? He said, 
That's not been your experience. In other words, he's saying, go back, you non-thinking, idiotic, dull, uh, intellectually impotent Galatians. Go back and reflect upon how it was that you got saved. Think about that. Was it by the works of the law? No, it, it wasn't. Then how was it? It was by the hearing of faith. All who receive the Spirit, they are saved. How did you do that? You did it by faith. You believed. This is how their Christian life began, and he wants them to go back and reflect upon it and rehearse it in their minds. And he says, what part was it that you, you Galatian believers, what part did you play in it? And they would have to respond by saying, Paul, we played no part in it. We had no role in it. We had no responsibility except to embrace it by faith. He said, was it, was it, did it involve any works of the law whatsoever? They said, no. He said, it came by the hearing of faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It doesn't even say that faith comes by reading or faith comes by studying or faith comes by small groups and gathering together and having fellowship. All of that is good. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's why we have as a ministry over the many decades gathered together and proclaimed the truth of God from a pulpit in a local assembly because faith comes by hearing. And our faith is strengthened as we hear it. And our faith grows as we listen to it and as we receive it and welcome it into our hearts. It has nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with our performance. The law says, do this. That's not the gospel. The gospel says, Christ has done it all. There's nothing for you to do. The law requires works of human achievement. But the gospel requires faith in Christ's achievement. It's not about my merit. Or your merit. It's about the merit, the only merit that God accepts, and that's Christ. The law makes demands and bids us to what? Obey. The gospel brings promises, and it bids us only to believe. Martin Luther once said, he said, the establishing of the law is the abolishing of the gospel. And yet subtly we can do this in our lives why? Because we can become like the Galatians. We start to become non-thinkers. We stop reflecting on the value of Christ openly crucified. We stop uh, stopped thinking and considering the glorious nature of Paul's message. Is it any wonder why? I, I, every time I think about it, it reminds me. Of course God had to choose someone like the Apostle Paul. Of course he did. Because even the apostles that walked with Jesus, that heard all of those messages and witnessed all of those miracles, do you know that they, they, would, they came under such pressure as the church began to even then to kind of subtly conform to a, a unique form of Judaism and call it Christianity. God knew that they just didn't quite get it. So what he ended up doing was choosing someone and calling someone who didn't even walk with Jesus or see him or be with him or listen to the messages and see the miracles, he raised up the Apostle Paul and he took him to Arabia and he taught him the gospel of grace and he said, I love the other 12. They're awesome. They're amazing. And they're going to be used greatly. But I need you to champion this gospel called grace. That's amazing. One called out of season, he said. He says, but God called me from my mother's womb for this great purpose. Don't allow the law in any subtle form to be established in your life. If you do, it's the abolishing of grace. Don't frustrate the grace of God. He goes on to say in verse 5, he says, does he, God, the one that supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do so by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? In other words, having begun this way in the Spirit, and this is really what it's all about. Our lives are reduced to our confidence in the Holy Spirit. Our lives are reduced to a complete and utter dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Yes, we know that the, the flesh wages war against the Spirit. The Spirit against the flesh. The flesh against the Spirit. These two are contrary the one to the other. Paul wrote in this same book of Galatians in the fifth chapter, so that you cannot do the things that you would. That's true. And as someone well put it, he says, all of us, we are just walking civil wars. The spirit warring against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. So what's the answer? How can we live an overcoming kind of a life? The same way Paul discovered it in the book of Romans. 
by depending completely upon the Spirit. The law wasn't given for justification. The law was given for condemnation. That's all it's capable of doing. And it fulfilled its purpose by taking sinners, people that were condemned, and dropping them at the doorstep of the grace of God, handing us to Jesus and saying, as, as if the law could speak, I couldn't do it, but I fulfilled my job. I fulfilled my role. I fulfilled my mission. I have completely condemned them, and now they're all yours for the purpose of justification. And he hands us to Jesus, and we find that we now are the recipients of his righteousness. And we are now justified in the sight of God, just as if we had never, ever sinned. You know, the argument that Paul uses in this book is from the Old Testament scriptures. He takes us back to Abraham. He doesn't notice it. He doesn't take us back to Moses. He takes us back before Moses. He takes us back to Abraham because his, his Judaizing opponents, they all look to Moses as their teacher. But he goes centuries further back to Abraham, to Genesis 15, 6. He says, remember what happened then? He said, God made Abraham a promise, just like he did with the promise of forgiveness through the cross. It was based upon a promise. And, and glory to God, don't we love our father Abraham? Because even though he couldn't figure it all out, even though he didn't understand how he could be declared righteous in the sight of God, he did the thing that you and I need to be focusing on every moment of our lives. And what was that? He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief in Romans chapter 4, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. That's all he did. And aren't we his children this morning? We are Abraham's children this morning. You say, I'm not a direct Jewish descendant. If you are a believer in Christ, you are a direct descendant of your father, the father of your faith, Abraham. Because he believed God, despite the improbability of the promise. And it was an improbability. From human viewpoint, what did he do? Abraham did what God asks us to do. Cast ourselves upon the faithfulness of God. And when we cast ourselves upon the faithfulness of God, we will never be disappointed. We will never be looking at ourselves. We will never be expecting anything to come forth from a life that can only offer God its brokenness, only offer God its weakness, only offer God its inability to do whatever it is that he asks. Abraham's faith <laughs> was counted, reckoned as righteousness. That is, he himself accepted as being righteous by faith. He wasn't justified because he, he'd done anything to deserve it or, or that he was even, you know, had become circumcised or that he even kept the law for neither circumcision of the, or the law had even been given at that point. He simply believed God. The Galatian converts were already sons of Abraham by circumcision. No, no, it wasn't that they were sons of Abraham by circumcision. It was that they were sons of Abraham by faith. Their faith made them Abraham's children. You don't need to share in Abraham's physical descent in order to be true children of God. You're his children because you share in his faith. And that's, you see, we're seeing the fulfilling and the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. He said, and you, you, will, you will believe and your descendants, Abraham, will be greater than the number of stars in the sky or sand on the seashores. And we are the fulfillment of that promise here this morning. He was not referring to Abraham's literal physical descendants, although indeed they would be many. He was speaking of the children of his faith. That's us. Imagine as you sit here this morning, you are the fulfillment of God's promise because you believe God just like the father of your faith did. And you've been made, to, and well, you, you can't improve upon the righteousness by faith. Closing this morning, what is the gospel? What was Paul's message? What was he trying to get across to these believers in the province of Galatia? He said, it's the gospel. You must always remember it. It's Christ crucified. It's his finished work on the cross. It's not primarily the, you know, the baby in the manger, although it starts there, or a young man at a carpenter's bench, although we read about that, or a, a preacher in Galilee, and we know Jesus did that, or even an empty tomb. The gospel is 
about the cross of Jesus Christ. Because even that impeccable life, even that perfect life that he lived, and isn't it interesting that when you ask people that are unsaved in the world, don't know the truth about the gospel of grace, you say, what's the gospel? They say, oh, it's following Jesus. It's being, it's, it's being like Jesus. Well, good luck with that. It's like being, yeah, I'll just ask myself, what would Jesus do? I'll tell you what Jesus do, what Jesus would have you do. He'd have you believe on him. He'd have you embrace him by faith. You, you just follow the simple instructions. You know, I love that when you get to share the gospel of grace with, with precious Catholics and they say, well, I'm not sure. I think Catholicism is the way of, you know, entering heaven. I say, listen, you believe in Jesus. Yes, I do. Well, you, and you know that you could trust his mother. Oh, absolutely, we can trust Mary. Well, well what did Mary say? Mary said it in John's Gospel, chapter 2, at the wedding of Cana. She just said to those people, whatever he says to you, do it. What does he say? You must be born again. Now, you honor his mother, and you do that, and you'll be saved. <laughs> That's all. She got it right. Amen? When she had a problem, what did she do? She brought it to Jesus, and she left it right there. Boy, what a great example she is. Why? Why would Mary do such and walk and live in such simplicity? Because she knew what we knew. I am what I am by the grace of God. I don't have anything to bring to the table. I don't have any ability. I don't have any strength. I don't have any power. I don't have a will to persevere. I don't have this, this great goal and objective that I'm going to finish strong. I can't do all any of those things. I am a product of the grace of God. And I want grace to be the starting point of my life. Life. And I want grace to keep me as I wander through this journey and all of the years that God has for me on the planet. And I want grace to carry me across the finish line. And I want to stand before Christ someday and say, you did it all. You saved me. You kept me. You held on to me. I wanted to wander. I wanted to go in a different direction. I wanted to live a different life. But you were there holding me, keeping me, preserving me, strengthening me, carrying me, never letting me go, loving Loving me when I wanted to go astray, and it's all to the glory of your great grace. It's all to the glory of your grace. That's what the gospel is. The gospel is the Christ on his cross. And what does it offer? Justification, the gift of the Spirit. God never bestows one without the other. Isn't that the greatest news we'll ever hear? He not only bestows justification, but then the Spirit comes along with that justification and seals the deal in Ephesians 1.13 and in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3. And then what does the gospel require this morning? What do we have to do to receive these blessings? Absolutely Nothing. You say, but we have to believe. Well, yeah, believing is the only thing you can do, and when you've done it, you haven't done anything. How can you boast in, I believed, I believed, I believed. <laughs> what did you do? Nothing. I believed. Exactly. Seven times in verses 1 through 9 in the third chapter, the noun faith and the verb to believe in this very brief paragraph. It's like God was just kind of squeezing it into the third chapter of Galatians and said, please, if you get nothing else, get this. That's the gospel of both the Old and the New Testaments. The gospel preached to Abraham and the gospel Paul preached. And thank God today, it's the gospel we still preach. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? It could be that you are here this morning and you have never, like Abraham, simply believed God. That's all he did. He believed God. I think, realistically, we could probably preach a lot more messages about Abraham's failures than we could speak about his victories. But neither his failures nor his victories entered into the reality of his being declared righteous in the sight of God. That had everything to do with his faith. It's not about performance this morning. It's not about how good or bad you might be. 
It's all about Christ. Will you cast yourself on the work of the cross this morning? Will you believe on what Christ did for you? Because if you begin this way, and if you allow him to justify you and to give you his spirit, then you will continue to walk by means of the spirit. You will not only be saved, but you will continue to be delivered. You will, you will be perpetually being saved from all that would try to ruin your life and ruin your soul. Let him do that for you this morning. Come just as you are, with no promises to be better, with no plans to improve. Just come as you are. Cast yourself at the foot of the cross and let him save you. Let him redeem you. Let him deliver you. Let him give you a new heart, a new mind, a new way of thinking, and a new way of living. Come just the way you are this morning and say, Jesus, save me. Cleanse me. Make me your own. I'm believing on you. If you said that prayer of faith, would you just put your hand up so we can pray for you this morning? 